terms that we need to become familiar with uh, relation function domain and range uh, a relation is a set of input and output very uh, values represented in ordered pairs right so based off that definition we're looking at kind of a, a, a wide variety of different possibilities all right so really any coordinate that you've ever plotted can be thought of as a relation all right, it's a relationship between two variables, variable x, variable y, all right? But what we need to do is contextualize. We need to look at this as, all right, well, what is my x variable going to represent and what is my y variable going to represent, all right? If you think back to the DART activity, the x variable sometimes represented, well, just x, a horizontal distance. The y variable sometimes represented just y, but but then sometimes it changed, all right? X represented time, and Y represented horizontal distance. You know, the, the, uh, the relationship varies, all right? We need to go even beyond that, beyond physical movement, and talk about relationships that may be um, more abstract, all right? So uh, here, here's a very basic example. And I, I think it does a pretty good good idea of getting across the relationship between um, two variables. Because you're looking at eye color and student's name, all right? So there's a correspondence there. I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm very bad at that. Like, I don't know, like, if, if I go to another room and somebody asked me, you know, they say the name of a person. They say, what color eyes does this person have? I like, I couldn't even tell you. They could give me multiple choice and I would just be guessing. All right? I, I would have no idea. And, I, and I, I tend to look at people like in the eye when I'm, when I'm speaking to them. It's just it doesn't register. But then sometimes I'll be like, all right, uh, I, I need to talk to this person. Maybe I've never met them before. And they'll say, all right, go on up to the, the counseling center and look for the person with the green eyes. And I'm like, green eyes? I'm supposed to look everybody in the eyes in order to identify who they are? But some people just notice that, you know? So it, it's kind of strange, but that, that is a relationship. I mean, you're, you're a person and, you're, and you have an eye color, all right? But that doesn't mean that one is going to necessarily cause the other to happen, for example, just because you're named Tony doesn't mean you're guaranteed to have brown eyes or vice versa. All right. So, but there, there is a relationship. There's a correspondence. All right. So if I look at this and say, what is that relationship? All right. Can I identify a person based off knowledge of their eye color? I mean, may not be practical, but is it possible, right? A specific identification. Like, if I know the eye color, will I know the, the ap exact name of the person? All right, well, not based off of this information, all right? Because I have green corresponding with Sally, but green also corresponds with Poe. I have blue corresponding with Erie and blue corresponding with Ava. All right, so there's uncertainty. Yeah, it's a little too brown. I have brown corresponding with Ben, brown corresponding with Tony. All right, so if I tell you that the person has brown eyes, you could not tell me the name of the person. You can give me some choices, you can give me some possibilities, but you can't tell me the name, the, the precise name of the person. All right, if I, if, if, um, the main office called down and they said, all right, we need, we need, there's a student in your class, can't remember their name, but they have brown eyes. No help, all right? But they'd have to give more than that, all right? They'd have to give more information, all right? So because of the, that missing information, because the in, we have the inability to pin it down to a particular answer, a singular particular answer, it's not gonna be a function. A function is a relationship that pairs each input with exactly one output. Exactly one output. All right. Exactly one output. All right. And the whole idea behind that is predictability. 
right? Being able to draw a singular conclusion from an input variable, all right? That's the basis of experimentation, right? Scientific inquiry. It's also the basis of just real life analysis. You know, like if it is cold out, right? look, just very simple conditional sentences. If it is cold out, there, there are outcomes that, that correspond to that. Like may, maybe it's as simple as I will wear a jacket, All right? So it, if that's my output, then that could be a function. But then if you have something like, if it is less than 30 degrees out, I'll wear a jacket. If it's between 30 and 50 degrees out, I'll wear a sweatshirt. If it's greater than 30 degrees, I'll wear just a t-shirt. Right, still a function because depending on whatever those temperatures are, I only have one possible outcome. All right. Now, if it becomes something like, I, I don't know, if it, if it's less than thirty, you know, depending on how I'm feeling, I might I might wear a, a jacket or a sweatshirt because there's two possible outcomes. It's it's over. It's not a function. All right. You've lost that predictability. All right. So by the numbers, it's actually, it's, it's pretty simple. It's the contextual situations that make it more complicated, right? Because we have, we have procedures when it comes to the numbers. And, and I, I forget what class it was, but I told, I told a class yesterday, it, could, it couldn't have been an Algebra 1 class, you were all taking a test. But I, I told a class yesterday that it wasn't until I was well into my teaching career that I actually understood intuitively what a function was. All right, I could I could do all the steps. I can get an I can get an answer. I had no problem getting the answer. I, I followed the steps. It was fine. I didn't know why I was important. All right, so there there is a learning curve when it comes to that. But for now, what a lot of people will do is they'll say, "Well, these are the steps I follow to determine if a relation is a function." If I do that, I'll either say yes or no, and I'll get the answer right. All right. If I don't, then I won't. All right. But what we need to do is work towards trying to understand the, the conceptual aspect of it, because that's more meaningful. All right. You think about any kind of lab in a science class, you know, and even the DART activity here. You know, like you did the math. You know, the math the, the math was tricky, especially with the changes in variables. So like that, that's one thing, but then the, the conclusion writing, you know, that, that's, that's what we want to work towards getting better at because when you write the conclusion, it's like, all right, what do I write down? Well, what's my answer? No, that's not what, what is your answer? What did you determine? What, what conclusions did you draw? You know, it's not what, what is the right answer. There is no right answer. I mean, there's, there's right -ter answers than other answers, but there's no one specific right answer. It's just based off of your observations, right? The conclusions that you draw based off of the context, right? So that we're always going to be coming back to that. Some of us really like that, and some of us are like, oh, can we just take a test? You know, it's it's unfortunate for some that you're not going to get what you want, but it is what it is. You know, it's the, that's the 21st century way of learning, right? So anyway, mathematically or numerically, I should say. Uh, you have this little table here. It says not okay for a function versus okay for a function. All right? It's kind of a weird way of saying it, but let me explain. If I plot 5, 1, and 5, 4, just the ordered pairs, 5, 1, and 5, 4. All right, so five, one, and five, four. Graphically, it creates a vertical arrangement. It's kind of a it's kind of a nice relationship here, because you know, like in 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 the title of the little table or this cell of the table, it says not okay for a function. But this is this would not be a function because if I give you an input of five, you get multiple outputs of one and four. So just kind of think it out 
or talk it out to yourself. I, I, I don't know. Some people don't like doing that. I, I find I talk to myself all the time, which is a mark of either brilliance or insanity, or maybe a, maybe a combination of the two things. But anyway, ask yourself, if my input is five, what is my output? What number, what single number is my output? The input is five. The output, well, it's either one or four, all right? I can't pin it down to a single number, all right? Because I can't pin it down to a single number, it's not a function, all right? It's as, it's, I'll say it's as simple as that, but it's the context of it that we want to work to understand because what you can do, I'll tell you this right now, if you can look at the data points and say, all right, they plot vertically, one on top of the other, not a function, done. You'll get it right, you'll have no idea why, all right? It's the, it's the verbalization part of it, all right? The part where you start thinking about why that's not the case, all right? So I kind of look at it like, let's say five represents the number of hours of studying before a test or a quiz, all right? And the, the one and the four represent the score out of a, out of a possible value of four, four being the best. You know, like a 4.0 GPA, like the grade point averages, yeah, four being the best, one being the, the worst passing grade that you can get, all right? If I tell you that you study for five hours before a test and you're either gonna get a one out of four on that test or a four out of four on that test, you're like, you've told me nothing, all right? I'm gonna study for five hours and I'm either gonna bomb it or ace it. I, I got no useful information out of that, all right? That, that's a contextual way of representing this and it gives us a good idea of what's going on with the problem. All right. Numerically, it means one thing, but in terms of, you know, in, in real life, what does it mean? Something different, all right. So, five, two, four, two, let me just move some points around. I gotta erase two. Actually, I should've just erased the whole thing. Four, two, five, two. So four, two would be one, two, three, four, two, right about here. Come on, comma. And five, two would be right there. All right, so five, two, four, two plots like this. I'm just gonna move it a little bit more. There we go. Now, this is a horizontal arrangement. Now, this is, this is a function because it says it is, but it's also a function because if I tell you that if you study for four hours, you're gonna get a two on the assessment out of, out of four. If you study for five hours, you're gonna get a two on the assessment. That's not conflicting information. What it's saying is that a difference of one hour of study time isn't really gonna make much of a difference. It's not gonna make any difference in the outcome, all right? And, and that's possible, you know? But it could also be something like this. Let's say you had five, three. Five, three, that's, that's even reasonable, right? Because if I say that I get or have four hours of study and I get a two on the assessment versus five hours of study and I get a three on the assessment, that's not, that's not an unreasonable outcome and it's not conflicting, all right? But the other instance is conflicting. I'm getting conflicting information. I'm getting conflicting reports, all right? It's like, you come home, you didn't do so well on a science test, all right? You tell your parent, but I studied. I worked really hard in class. Then the teacher emails home and says, hey, by the way, I just wanna let you know that your kid is not studying and working really hard in class. 
all right, conflicting pieces of information, right? Same student, but two different outcomes. Input student, outcome, how hard they're working in class. Conflicting reports, not a function, all right? So domain represents all possible input values. Range represents all possible output values. So what we do in order to state the domain is we just identify any unique input value. All right. So I go across my set of ordered pairs. Any input value, any x value, I would identify, but only the unique ones. Any repeats, I would disregard. So I highlighted green, blue, and brown. I see another blue, ignore. I see another brown, ignore. I see another green, ignore. All right, so my domain, we write domain with a capital D. It, it, this, this is going to be the unit of notation also, vocabulary and notation. It's, it's the, the branching off point between all the rote skills that you've learned in the previous years, you know, computational skills, and then getting into what we call uh, analytics, right, algebra. Then we get into trigonometry and things like that, right? So it's really a branching off point, but we got to get to a, a solid understanding of the terminology and vocabulary, all right? So the proper way of writing a domain is a capital D with a colon and then a squiggly bracket, all right, to open it up. And then you indicate what the domain is separated by commas, all right? So green, blue, and brown. All right, do the best you can with the squiggly brackets. My, uh, it's not really my rule, it's everybody's rule. It's, you don't have to make it picture perfect as long as they don't look like regular parentheses and they don't look like square brackets. All right, so we, we don't want this and we don't want this. All right, now what I, what I would do back in the day before I was comfortable making my exceptionally ordinary squiggly brackets. I would make a little S and then a backwards S to join in the middle. And that's how I'd come up with my squiggly bracket. But now, now I got to a point where I just kind of do it all in one shot. All right, it doesn't look as nice, but it goes quicker. You know, so you just bless it. So, so you just bang it out, you see. You just do it as quick as you can. But what, I, what I'll see is a lot of people just do this. You know, just something that looks squiggly. I, I, honestly, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Again, as long as it's not, it, it seems like a really dumb thing to be having this conversation over, but it's, it's actually fairly important, right? So we don't want square brackets for this when we're indicating particular values in a domain and we don't want parentheses. We want some kind of squiggly bracket as long as it looks somewhat along the lines of what a squiggly bracket should be, then you're fine, all right? I've had people, honestly, and, and it's not, like I never laugh at this, it's not anything unreasonable. During a test, they'll say, I'm good with all the math, how does my squiggly bracket look? Is it, is it good enough? And I'll be like, ah, honestly, you're gonna wanna clean that up. You know, like, and they'll be like, all right. Cause you know, like on the close, it's, it's the open one is fine, but the closed one, when they do it, I'm like, ah, it looks too much like a three. They're gonna take off on the regions for that. You know, so you, you, gotta, you gotta make it something distinguished from other characters, all right. All right, so for the range, we got Sally, Erie, Ben, Ava, Tony, and Poe, all unique names. I mean, unique as in different from one another. So we, we make a, a note of all of them. So then we determine if, this, if the relation is a function, all right? We know there's a relationship between the two variables. 
but we want to know if it represents a function. All right. And so that's what we were talking about before. I can't determine the name of the person simply by the eye color. All right. So no, because we cannot determine the name of the person simply by the eye color. And again, I mean, it, it's kind of weird because practically speaking, it, it would be kind of helpful. Like if somebody came into the room and, and the room was populated with these individuals, Sally, Yuri, Ben, and so on. And they said, all right, I need one of these, to, uh, like I need the student, uh, like I, don't, I didn't get the name, but I know they have green eyes. It, it's, it's practical. Now you've, you've narrowed it down to just two students. All right, we got to go to the main office. I don't know which one I was supposed to, to bring up. Let, let's all go and one of you is coming back because I don't need you both, but I'm not sure which one I need. So I'll take you both and then we'll figure it out later. All right, practically speaking, you can make it work. At least you don't have to take the whole class. But in terms of being the definition of a function, not, not quite. All right. Now, if you're dealing with graphs, it's actually much, much easier to determine whether a relation is a function. Uh, a vertical line intersects a graph more than once, then the graph is not a function, right? So if a vertical line intersects a graph more than once, then the, the graph is not a function, the relation is not a function. So what I would do is draw a vertical line and drag that vertical line along the graph. And actually, uh, I forgot, I picked this up last period for like the first time ever. The, the definition is missing a word. It's if any vertical line intersects the graph more than once. All right. So I take my vertical line and I drag it along the curve and I just take note of whether it intersects more than once. All right. This vertical line is only going to intersect this parabola called a parabola if you didn't know, uh, only exactly once. All right, no matter where I put this vertical line, you're only gonna get one intersection. All right, only one intersection. So this is a function. All right. For the second one, it depends, but in most cases, if I draw a vertical line, I'm going to get more than one intersection. All right. Now there is there is one location where you'll get exactly one intersection, but if it ever happens that you get more than one intersection, it's not a function. All right. So here, for example, is an instance in which you have more than one intersection. So not a function. All right. So just because it works, quote unquote, quote unquote works in one location, doesn't mean it's a function. It's got to work in all locations, meaning only have at most one intersection. All right. So looking at the last one, this is, we'll get to this later in the course, but this is known as a piecewise function. And all it is is two separate graphs that are pieced together to make one graph. All right, so part of one, part of another, pieced together. All right, that's the, that's the basic definition of it. So as I move along from left to right, I see only one intersection between my red vertical line and the black horizontal line that's there. Then I get to the y-axis, I see one intersection. That open circle doesn't count because we know open circles exclude points. 
right? So there's actually no point at that open circle. The only point on the y-axis is that at the closed circle below the y uh, below the x-axis. And then as I continue on to the right, I see only one intersection. All right, you just got to be careful because sometimes it could be confusing. You'll see the x-axis and the y-axis there, and you're like, oh, there's two intersections. No, one of those is the one of those is the x-axis. That doesn't count. All right, we don't count the axes. We only count the actual graph. All right, so only one intersection the whole the whole way through. So this would be a function. And also, I gave it away in the beginning when I told you the title of that graph, which is known as a piecewise function. It's got a function in its name, so you know, it's a pretty good indicator that it's a function. You know. And you'll see that there, there, there's little tricks that I'll, uh, I'll clue you in on as we go forward, because even, even notation can tell you whether or not what you're dealing with is a function. Like, like if an equation has an F in it, like instead of saying Y equals, it says F equals, the F stands for function. So you wouldn't have to do any of this because it's, it's the author's way of telling you that the equation is a function. You wouldn't even have to investigate that. All right. So under the practice here, now these are all things that technically you could probably handle at this point, but I'll, I'll take you through a few more. Just because it, it's it's weird, like I, I remember learning this for the first time, and it's like, how does this have anything to do with anything, right? If you're feeling like that right now, then you're not you're not wrong, you know, because it, it does it does feel disjointed, but then it comes together as we go forward, and it starts to make a lot more sense. But right now, we're just learning the building blocks, all right? So for this one, this is kind of a weird instance. But a vertical line is actually not a function. Even though we used the, the vertical line test to determine whether a relation is a function, the vertical line actually fails its own test. All right? Because what will happen is you'll have a complete overlap, which means you're going to have infinitely many intersections. Whereas for the horizontal line, I could move my vertical line across that graph and I'm only going to have one intersection. No matter where I place it, only one intersection. That's not too bad in terms of difficulty. All right? that, that one is a function. Only one intersection no matter where I put it. Because numbers three and four, there's in each case an instance where if I can I place my vertical line, it's going to have two intersections, and all it, it just has to happen in one location, where it has two intersections, one instance of two intersections, and it's not a function. All right. So then number two, state the domain and range, and then state whether it's a function. So it, this is just like the eye color question. You just go across and identify any unique X values. Now you'll notice that last X value is a repeat or, or a repeat of a previous X value. So we don't need to write that. So I would say my domain colon squiggly would be numerical values. We tend to put them in increasing order. So negative two, one, three, four. the range, the y values, so three, seven, blah, blah, blah. But then that negative three is a repeat also. So in increasing order, I have negative three, three, five, seven. So they're asking if it's a function. Now I can determine whether it's a function based off of plotting these points. But I could also determine it based off of just contextualizing. You know? So you think about what the x value could represent. Now, it's probably not going to represent something like hours of, of study. You got a negative number there. Right? So, but you, know, you could think about that in terms of you know, maybe it's 
temperature or something like that. I mean, the numbers are a little weird, but you, you could think about it in, in the, uh, whatever way makes sense, actually. So, but focus on any instance in which the X value is repeating. Right? Because those are the only instances, if you're going to have something that's not a function, that's, that's going to be your key indicator. All right. So what happens here is 1 corresponds to 3 or negative 3. All right. So my input of 1 corresponds to two separate outputs. All right, it doesn't correspond to a single output, it corresponds to multiple outputs. So that makes this not a function. Honestly, I mean, if you, if you want to do the hours of studying, you could. I mean, the, the negative two would throw things off a little bit, but you could say, all right, I study for one hour, I get a three out of 10 on the test. All right. Or if I study for one hour, I'll get a negative three out of 10. All right. I mean, that, that, that's a contradiction, All right? As opposed to studying for four hours and get a five. And uh, I mean, the, the negatives, like I said, they throw things off a little bit, but it's, it's still something you can kind of, kind of reason through, All right? Then the last one, the last one's uh, probably the weirdest looking one, but it's really the same concept as number two. It's just they, they write the ordered pairs differently, right? The domain would be the set of values in the A bubble, and the range would be the set of values in the B bubble, but only the ones that involve arrows, right? So three corresponds to two. 4 corresponds to 1, 5 corresponds to 9, 6 corresponds to 12, and 7 corresponds to 12. All right? You, you could actually write these as ordered pairs. You could say 3, 2, 4, 1, 5, 9, 6, 12, and 7, 12. It means the same thing. You'll notice how the eight didn't really work, as or the three or the eight didn't work their way in in that in the second bubble in the B bubble, just because they don't have an arrow pointing to them, right? So it's not it's not relevant to the range. So my domain would be three, four, five, six, seven, and I usually get the question, can we just write from three to seven? The answer to that is no, because that allows for all the decimal values along the way from three to seven, all right? And that's not part of the set. So I don't, I don't see a 3.25 here. So if you wrote three to seven, that would include all those decimals and then that would be incorrect, all right? For the range, the only relevant range values, one, two, nine, and 12, because the 12 repeats. And again, we ignore the ones, even though they're in the bubble, we ignore it because it's not part of the relation, all right? So then in terms of whether it's a function, we would take note of any repeats in the X values. I don't see any repeats in the X values. All right, so that's great, which means that there's no contradiction, there's no conflict, all right? Each X value corresponds to a unique Y value. Right, or its own y value. Now, the, the thing that confuses people fairly frequently is this last pairing here, the 6, 12, 7, 12. But I, I kind of look at that and say, you know, just like what we did on the previous page, if I study for six hours, I can get a 12 out of 20, 12 out of whatever on a test. If I study for seven hours, I could get the same grade. That's possible, all right? If I study for six hours, and I get either a 12 or a seven, that's a contradiction, all right? I don't have a contradiction here. These are all possible. So this would be a function.
All right. So no contradiction. in outputs based on inputs. Now, tomorrow, we're going to do three and four together. So what I'm going to ask you to do is try, try pages three and four on your own tonight. Because some of them are pretty interesting. They're contextual examples. But I don't want to just kind of leave you with that. We're going to go through all of those problems tomorrow. It's, that, that's how important this stuff is. All right. So definitely take your time with it, but uh, if you if you struggle with it, don't don't lose too much sleep over it because we're going to go over it together. <laughs>